Thank you kindly for joining us on the I Love Seville show. We are in a studio located on Market Street in downtown Charlottesville. We very much enjoy connecting with you through a show that is a labor of love for us, the I Love Seville show. It airs Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 12.30 to anywhere between 1.15 and 2 o'clock, depending on how busy the schedule is and the ammunition or or talking points that we have to offer. I think today's show is a, a very good one. Um, I've heard from um, hundreds of folks, individual parties, parents, students, teachers, administrators, alumni of Charlottesville High School, and they've offered uh, appreciation and um, supportive words of our coverage um, since last Friday on what has turned into a concerning situation at the only high school in the city of Charlottesville, a situation that has, whether we want to admit this or not, it's, it's no longer news tied to Charlottesville, and it's news that's gaining momentum um, in the United States and across the country. We'll talk about some of that momentum with the Uvalde Foundation offering Charlottesville High School now um, protection. We'll explain that. I heard from a number of parents who either watched or were in person at the listening session yesterday, um, last night, and the common denominator from the feedback from the parents, and, and I watched it online, um, in my humble opinion, their Facebook page did a good job of, of, of videoing and streaming um, the broadcast. So you can find it online on the In My Humble Opinion Facebook page. I think at this point, and I'm curious of what your take, moms and dads and teachers and administrators and students that watch or listen to the show. We had the Cavalier Daily reach out to us um, yesterday saying they watched the show for a, a uh, piece that they want to put together in uh, their newspaper, the UVA newspaper. I'm curious of what your um, thoughts are of the listening session yesterday. You know, I... I think we are beyond the point of listening and hosting sessions to listen to learn, and we are at the point of needing a plan of action. And interestingly, last night, the listening session started with instruction um, from the moderator that we, the conversation or the topic matter of school resource officers and other sensitive topics would not be permitted in the listening session. I found that perplexing at best, concerning um, as well. Um, not having a conversation about school safety and, and referencing or not referencing um, school resource officers is, is just like not being in touch with, with today's reality. Um, if, if school resource officers are not on the tips of most people's tongues on this rainy Tuesday morning, then, then I, I'm not sure you're reading the tea leaves correctly. No one wants metal detectors, but I know a lot of people are thinking about metal detectors. A lot of folks are considering what the security protocols are for um, secondary entrances to the high school and how they can be exploited and the security around those secondary entrances, how they can be improved upon. So, you know, I understand the concept of listening to learn and having listening sessions, and maybe it's a, a kumbaya type of tactic to get everyone in a room and, and around the campfire with the guitar and the marshmallows and the graham crackers and trying to build a, a sense of solidarity. But when it comes to our children, the campfire kumbaya is, 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 is something that I I think is of, of months ago and not today. Um, so I'm going to ask you, viewers and listeners that are watching this show, was the listening session any value? Was there any value whatsoever with last night's listening session? Or did you find the listening session um, infuriating or frustrating or, or out of touch or lacking tangible um, action plans. That's, you know, how I viewed it. I also want to talk on, on today's show about the Uvalde Foundation offering um, 
volunteer protection. We have a nonprofit from Texas. Judah will give us a little bit of a, about the Uvalde Foundation here in a matter of moments. It's a national nonprofit. They formed in May, this nonprofit formed in May of 2022 following a school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. This nonprofit is recruiting adults and volunteers to join its um, patrol for Charlottesville High School. So now you have a national nonprofit with a national following pushing Charlottesville High School into the national news cycle. And that clearly is happening. And if you can consider this from the parameters of a news story, if you're a reporter, you have the makings or the foundation of, of something that, you know, is going to gain approval and publication from your editors and producers. 30 to 50 students not listening to authority, defiant students instigating melees and brouhaha's and brawls in classrooms and hallways and libraries and breezeways and in cafeterias. 30 to 50 students basically shut down a school. I mean, that's the movie script of multiple movies we have all seen. Lean on me. Dangerous Minds. We've all seen these movies. I also want to talk on today's show about the University of Virginia. This should not surprise you, but it's important to cover. A record number of applicants for the class of 2028, 2028, excuse me, 2028, UVA, a record number of applicants for early action and early decision for the class of 2028. Listen to this number. 42,093 students applied early action or early decision for the class of 2028. That's a 3.4% increase from the 40,713 early action and early applications received for the class of 2027. I'll, I'll give you that statistic again. 42,093 students, Judah, mm -hmm. applied to UVA early action or early decision to be a part of the class of 2028. The demand to attend the University of Virginia is now at an all-time high. I've highlighted this on the program here. As this demand continues to uptick, the admissions process will grant entry to more and more students to one of the best universities in the world, which will undoubtedly influence, that's for you, Jamie Turner, undoubtedly, influence the shape, the makeup, and the direction of Charlottesville and Almoral County and beyond. We'll talk about that on today's show. I want to talk about a new restaurant on the downtown mall. That new restaurant is called Bonnie and Reed. It's in the old Brasserie Cezanne location. And the owner of Bonnie and Reed is a venture capitalist named Stefan Friedman. And Mr. Friedman has been on a buying bonanza. Stefan Friedman has under his ownership the following brands and businesses. Draft Tap Room, which he says will open this spring. One of Judah's favorites, Draft Tap Room. Yeah. Ace Biscuit and Barbecue. Bonnie and Reed, a seafood restaurant, as mentioned in the old Brasserie Saison location. And Vitae Spirits, formerly owned and founded by, was it Mr. Ian Glomsky, Judah? That's correct. Stefan Freeman is going to move the Vitae Spirits Tap Room from Water Street to the location directly next to Brasserie Cezanne. What, did, what, did, what was it previously called? Was it Brasserie Cezette? Uh, you're talking about the place next door? Yeah. I think, yeah, it was uh, something like that. We two shot in you over there? One of, he's wearing one of my favorite sweaters that he owns right there, uh, looking quite dapper. The Judah Wickhauer. I, I believe it was Brasserie Cezette, right? Uh, it's 
Suzette, I think. Let's see. Hold on. It's a brilliant idea. He buys Vitae Spirits, and he's going to move it in the storefront completely, directly right next to Brasserie Saison. And he's going to say, if you want reservations or you're waiting for a table for my new restaurant, Body and Read, a seafood restaurant, the executive chef, Chris Humphrey, Chris Humphrey is a known commodity, fantastic chef, one-time owner of Fellini's, Chris Humphrey, one-time executive chef at Rapture Restaurant, one-time executive chef at um, Brasserie Saison. I mean, he's an absolute known commodity and one of the best chefs out there. So Stefan Freeman, the venture capitalist, is going to say, look, you can hang out in the Vitae Spirits tasting room while you wait for a table at Bonnie and Reed. He's synergizing these two brands, Vitae Spirits, Vitae, Vitae, and Bonnie and Reed through geographical location and encouraging folks to go to the tap room before sitting down for a seafood dinner Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, dinner hours only for this restaurant. Judah Wickhauer, um, a lot we got to cover on today's program, including what I'm hearing from a lot of people is one of their favorite topics, the Judah and Jerry chitter chatter, where you and I talk anything uh, on the medulla oblongata. Um, a listening session. A few days after a planned sick out, I mean, a sick out, we should characterize what that really is, protest or a brief strike. Yeah. Parents and teachers and some elected, some school board members to be were in the audience, some school board members active were in the audience, administrators in the audience, students in the audience, alumni in the audience an eclectic group in this listening session. And the common denominator I've heard from those who attended or watched the stream online was, hey, aren't we past listening to learn and kumbaya? And aren't we more in the realm of action and the steps to breed safety and improve quality of life? I'm pretty sure a lot of the people that attended that meeting were expecting a lot more of the type of talk that would involve, here's our solution, here's how we're going to fix this, here's how when we come back from from Thanksgiving break, we are going to have a a firm hand and a firm firm grip on on the solution. And instead, I think they got uh, okay. So we, we know there's a problem, and we'd like to hear your ideas on how to fix it. And I don't think that inspires a whole lot of confidence uh, when the school has been announcing publicly that uh, when everyone comes back after the Thanksgiving break, things are going to be different. Well said. Vanessa Parkhill in Earliesville, one of our top ten viewers and listeners, <coughs> she says, on its face... The listening session was a good step toward offering an opportunity for people to be heard. Unfortunately, it sounds like maybe this session went the way of Meriwether Lewis renaming committee meetings. We want to hear you, but if you don't say what we want to hear, we will re-educate you until you say what we would like to hear, which will allow us to do what we wanted to do in the first place. That was naming a school. This is the safety of students and staff. All concerns should be heard and all solutions should be on the table. That's from a mother... Um, in Earliesville, and, and a very reasonable person, Vanessa Parkhill. I concur. The, the, yeah. the session legitimately started last night with the host of the session behind a podium on a stage in front of a packed house instructing those in attendance that you cannot or will not be allowed to talk about school resource officers or other sensitive topics. How is verbatim? That's what she said. We will not allow SRO talk or sensitive topic talk in this session. That's. I mean, did they define what sensitive is and and why? I think it might be up to the host's discretion. And when we're talking about not only teacher safety but especially student safety, it's all sensitive. What sense? No, I mean what. 
It's all concerning. I mean, but I, we're, no, what I, we go I ahead. Think, I think less than everything. I think nothing is sensitive. If we're talking about how we keep our children safe, how can anything be sensitive? Okay, I that's mean, better said than I said. An well honest said. discussion of how are you, how is this school going to protect our kids moving forward? Like, I'm sorry. There are things that I shouldn't talk about. What is this? Were were kids there? Were little children there? Were they? Was anyone bringing up? I mean, I don't even. What do you call sensitive discussion? I. It's just baffling to me. Okay, and and my description, and you said it better than I would. But my 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 take is anything we talk about here is going to elicit emotions and 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 be sensitive because we're talking about our our children. Yeah. And our staff's safety. Right. So the entire conversation, the entire premise of what was supposed to happen yesterday was going to involve commentary and conversation that was raw and real and yeah. concerning and making folks uncomfortable. And I, I, I'm seeing on Twitter from um, activist Twitter throwing absolute shade on... Metal detectors hmm. um, at the schools. You know, I, parents, what do you feel? Lisa Custolo, we'll get, your, get to your comments here in a matter of moments. Queen of Cherry Avenue watching the show. Chuck Ramey says he's very grateful for the content and the news that we um, air and broadcast right here on the I Love Seville show every day. Thank you, thank you, Chuck. We'd be foolish not to consider metal detectors. We would be foolish not to consider school resource officers again. We would be foolish not to consider um, vastly improved security infrastructure, including video and digital camera equipment within schools, especially pointed and directed at secondary entrances and exits especially pointed at areas where these fights and melees and brouhaha's have occurred. We would be crazy not to ask this question. The 30 to 50 students that have taken over a school at this point, will they be suspended? Will they be expelled? Are we considering alternative educational opportunities for these 30 to 50 students? I think we that's would, the biggest question. We would be crazy not to ask this question. And here's a sensitive question, but we would be crazy not to ask this question. Is the metho mythology of juking the stats, not punishing students to maintain graduation rates, backfiring on the high school in totality? And is juking the stats, not punishing students because we want to maintain graduation rates, a approach that should be canned or discarded or, or, or completely altered? or forgotten yeah these are all sensitive topics mm -hmm. and for the host or the administrator of the eliciting session in the very beginning to say that we can't have these conversations then the listening session is not one of value from my vantage point yeah definitely lisa costello if the charlottesville police department is called to the school to break up violence can they charge those who are violent like what would happen if police got called to our home? What do the police actually do after they break up the fight? That's a great question that should, great question. Great question right there. And, and how about this? When nearly a dozen police officers go to a high school on a multiple time basis over the first semester, I mean, it's not even Thanksgiving. What is the, here's another question I have. What is the tax payer outlay for that how much did that cost the community these 30 to 50 students most concerning most concerning are creating safety concerns at the school these 30 to 50 students are i mean let's cut to the chase have canceled school for three straight days yep. these 30 to 50 students have, whether we want to admit this or not, driven momentum behind the gentrification of a high school. Those with means are undoubtedly, there's that word, considering a different path of education. Mm -hmm. Those 30 to 50 students have 
teachers and staffers considering whether their future is at this high school, some of them, those 30 to 50 students got a principal to quit. Those 30 to 50 students have gotten the high school and the national and statewide news. Those 30 to 50 students have gotten teachers to strike, substitutes to say no to work. Those 30 to 50 students have also, and I'm curious of this monetary amount, Push the police, influence the police, cause the police, we back the blue on this show, to show up to restore civility and law and order at the school on a taxpayer, on taxpayer dimes. I hadn't heard about that. You hadn't heard of the police? Had a, you've heard of the police going to the school. I've we talked about that on Friday and Monday together. Okay. On, on this past Thursday... This past Thursday, nearly a dozen officers mm. called to the school. Wow. I mean, yeah, that is a lot, especially considering the, uh, you know, the shorthanded nature of, of the force right now. Buster Fox watching the program. Buster, um, talented baseball player from Monticello High School, Buster Fox. He's in the mortgage business, Buster Fox. One of the best pool players I'd ever seen from this area on the level of uh, local legend Bobby Anderson. He says, gentlemen, metal detectors will take too many resources to staff, in my opinion. I was but, thinking similar about the price and also uh, staffing some type of video system. Buster Fox also says, kids have binders, computers, X, Y, Z, and there will be so many false positives. Yeah. The cost of the unit and then staff you need to run it are overkill. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. He says two SROs would be very appropriate. We miss the understanding that an SRO may be the only positive experience could have with a police officer. We miss intangible things by having them in the school versus just having a backbone authority there. And, yeah. and Buster, jog my memory here. You played baseball at uh, Monticello High School, and the reason I know this is because I was a sports writer for the Daily Progress, and Buster was a standout baseball player at Monticello. Buster, if memory serves correct, either the head coach or the assistant coach of that Mustang baseball team when you were on it was Mr. Pete O'Malley. Jog my memory. And Mr. Pete O'Malley was in Almoral County, and I think still is an Almoral County police officer, and a, f a fine human being, Pete O'Malley. Please correct me if I'm wrong there, Buster. Pete O'Malley, your baseball coach, either head or assistant at Monticello High School, and you had a pleasant interaction as a teenager, as an impressionable teenager, with law enforcement. He makes the point that students, this could be the only, some students, positive interaction they have with law enforcement. Thoughts on that, Judah? That's a great point. Um, definitely. I, some of these kids are probably, you know, getting into trouble, and the SROs aren't necessarily there to, uh, you know, to be the letter of the law. Um, I think they're there to, you know, it's almost a, uh, <clears throat> what's the word, a... Uh, a, f a figure who can, you know, be be in place, be in the hallways, and someone that isn't a teacher, isn't a uh, isn't a um, you know ed an administrator, someone that kids who are causing trouble might have a little more respect for. Um, if they're, you know, we've heard stories of them walking through the halls and cussing out administrators and teachers. Cussing out the police. Yeah. On Thursday, the 30 to 50 students that are holding this school hostage not only are effing and cussing and four letter wording the teachers and administrators and staff, but they're doing it to the police. Right. That um, is the definition of ballsy and brazen. Yeah, they probably have a a poor a poor view of the police department, and they don't know these police who are coming into the school. One would think that uh, 
a school resource officer would be a, a figure that they see on a daily basis. Uh, hopefully can make some inroads into some of these groups, I would think, separate the kids who are just tagging along from the ones who are actually leading the, uh, you know, leading the pack. And that could, I'm, I don't know. I would hope that that could draw some of these, uh, these kids away from, uh, from these, from the, um, the bad influence. Um, we obviously won't know for sure. We don't know how they're going to interact with, uh, with these kids, but it's something. And when you need someone to break up a fight, I think it's, I don't think it's fair asking teachers to, dude, no uh, way it's fair to stand in that position. Yeah. There should be somebody at the school that can go in there and drag a couple kids apart. Um, Buster Fox confirms my commentary on, on Coach Pete O'Malley. And I want you to hear this from Buster Fox. I respect Buster tremendously. I have tremendous respect for Peter O'Malley. Pete O'Malley, the Monticello baseball assistant coach. He started, gosh, this is a blast from the past here. I covered Monticello baseball when I was a student at UVA and after... UVA when I was a staff writer and the high school sports editor at the Daily Progress. Buster, I believe it was Coach Mark Mace and then Pete O'Malley was an assistant for Coach Mark Mace and then Pete O'Malley took over as the head skipper for Monticello Baseball after Coach Mace went to the Shenandoah Valley. Buster says this, you are right. Coach Pete O'Malley retired from Almoral but is now with the Charlottesville Police Department. He literally has had one of the biggest impacts of any singular person in my life. Someone let Pete O'Malley know we're giving him some props on this show. Buster Fox says that Pete O'Malley had one of the biggest impacts of any singular people in his life. He was with Monticello Baseball, I don't know, from 2005 to current. Coach O'Malley has. And he said it went from Coach Mace, okay, Coach Mace to Dick, is it Harneff? Coach H, and then to uh, Pete O'Malley. Uh, thank you, Buster. Someone make sure Pete O'Malley knows he's getting props on this show. Pete O'Malley, A-plus stand-up guy. Here you got a Monticello graduate that's telling you the positive impact that a police officer who was also a baseball coach had on his life. I mean, on, Albert Graves says this. In regards to the metal detectors, there's no price that we can put on our kids. And everything should be considered. Because there's no price we can put on safety. Albert Graves also says, cussing the police and teachers are a direct reflection on the parenting they get at home. That's why certain parents of students at CHS should and need to take a long, hard look in the mirror. Lisa Custolo says, is it not true when the police are called to violence, police are free to decide to charge and take some into custody? Are they not free to do this at a high school? If not, Why? If they are not allowed to make an arrest on school property, why are they being called there? It's fair questions. It's fair questions. There's other topics we're going to cover on the show. And we're going to head to these other topics now in a matter of moments. I do want to highlight this. In fact, you want to throw the Uvalde Foundation in the mix. Why don't we start there with J-Dubs? Uh, the Uvalde Foundation, um, as Many of you know what happened in, in Uvalde, sadly. Uh, the Uvalde uh, Foundation is a, uh, a direct, uh, I guess, out, offshoot. Not offshoot, that's not right. But uh, it's, it's a byproduct. It was, it, yeah, it was, a, it was created in response to, to what happened. And um, it's a foundation that, uh, that focuses on... Um, uh, student and school advocacy on anti-bullying programs, um, aid for grants uh, for schools, um, students and families. Uh, they are a nonprofit and not the kind where 80% goes to the uh, the nonprofit and 20% gets squandered somewhere else. Uh, the 
officers, board members, teams, um, the program associates, uh, none of them receive salary or reimbursement. And, um, and the people involved in this are teachers, mental health professionals, police officers, city leaders, restaurant workers, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. Um, so this is a, uh, a foundation that really is dedicated to, to their, you know, their stated goal and not just something that somebody slapped together so they could, uh, you know, um, hit up charity auctions and line their pockets. Well said. They're recruiting adults for school patrols around Charlottesville High School. That's I, I applaud them. Yeah. Applaud them. I think, we, I think we still have to ask what, uh, what will the capabilities of those people be in regards to, you know, kids running around the schools. Um, I, I don't think those capabilities will be other, other, th other than an additional set of eyes and ears and a mouth for communication about trouble happening. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I don't think they will be breaking up brouhaha's. Right. I don't think they will be stopping uh, tomfoolery or melees of any kind. I think it's a perception is reality, additional eyes and adults around uh, vulnerable areas of the school. And I think that has value and merit. And it's concerning that that's the case. Yeah. Man. All right. I got uh, other comments, other topics that I need to get to on the uh, uh, I Love Seville show. Andrew, thank you for watching on Twitter. We appreciate you. Um, please, someone let Pete O'Malley know we're giving him some props. Thank you, Buster, for that insight. Kevin Yancey and Waynesboro start holding parents responsible, start locking parents up for their trifling entitled kids. Wow. I don't know if we can go that far. I think it is uh, a shame that most of these kids probably don't have a good, uh, a good parent. They don't have good parent figures, clearly. Um, I don't know about holding their parents responsible. Some of them may be single parents who are working multiple jobs trying to keep food on the table. Uh, we really don't know what they're what's going on there um and obviously those are going to be the you know we can shout until our till our lungs are empty that uh that parents need to take responsibility for their kids but we just don't know the uh we don't know the conditions behind what's going on with these people and at some point I think the school needs to take responsibility for what's going on with these kids because what they're doing, they're doing in school hallways and classrooms. And it would be great if we could hold the parents responsible and gain a, uh, I don't know, a find a way to, uh, to get these kids under control. But that I don't think that's going to happen through their parents. And I don't necessarily, you know, some of the parents probably do deserve what you're talking about, but I think a lot of them are just probably have, they, they would have as hard a time keeping control of their kids as anyone in the school. Kelly Jackson, a mother of two, including one in high school within Albemarle County Public Schools, says it should be a one and done rule. One fight you start and you are out. John Blair, who's a father and one of our top 10 viewers and listeners. Heck, John Blair is a top three viewer and listener on the I Love Seville show. This is a fantastic question from John Blair. Are you ready for this one? He says, when students return from Thanksgiving, should Charlottesville High School go back to a hybrid learning format on November 27th if parents are concerned about their student and child's mm. safety, give them an online option. Should they get an online option for their kids at least through the end of the first semester? That's a great question. That is a good question. I don't know. <laughs> why? why, why? I, I would say absolutely. Wasn't it, wasn't it difficult to set that up? For the infrastructure is already there. Already there, the infrastructure. Why not, if you're Charlottesville High School, offer the students 
and their parents. If you feel unsafe with what's happening in the school, you can finish the semester remotely. I suppose it's an option. I, I also think, uh, I don't, I believe that a lot of the reason why the kids that go to CHS, the ones that go there to learn, like the school is for the uh, the drama uh, the drama classes and the music classes, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, I, I think the drama and music are very talented components of Charlottesville High School, but I wouldn't say that the majority of students are attending Charlottesville oh. High School for drama and music. No, I and don't know. Not John is a, a majority either, but you said a lot. Uh, John's, you know, okay, we're nitpicking here. John said that just give them the option. If the parents are concerned and the students are concerned, give them the option. You can finish the semester with remote learning from home. I see no fatal flaw with that. Would it be either or? I mean, would you no, just No, it's not a hard, it's not a hard, you have to do this. But, it's the option. Okay, but how do you run a classroom where half the kids are, are on Zoom? I'm just asking Just questions. like they ran it during the pandemic. But when that, they created a hybrid scenario and yeah. gave kids the choice. They've already done this. Was it half and half? Was it? They gave kids the choice okay. of returning I, or doing it. For, this has already been done. This is not new or novel. Okay. They just replicate what's been done in the past. If you say so. Yeah. I mean, this, isn't, this, isn't, this is not uh, reinventing things. This is just utilizing the mythology that was done during the pandemic or coming out of COVID. Um, Suzanne Daly, no excuses for not showing respect, she says. There are people who have nothing and still raise their kids right. I respectfully disagree with Judah. It is not the school's responsibility to teach kids morals, period. Suzanne I didn't Daly. Say teach them morals. I said it's their responsibility to do something about them. Suzanne Daly has another comment, which we will get to first. Sharon Fix's comment came in. She says, No, the students can't get it together, should be doing. No, the students who can't get it together should be doing online. Why punish families and students who actually want to be there and are playing sports? You get in trouble. You have to do online for three months. If you, oh, That's Sharon takes it a different way. Yeah, I'm, I think I like that. Sharon, this I'm is sorry. clever. I'm sorry, you're no longer allowed in From Sharon in the Fix, halls. she says, take John Blair's on, idea of online learning and apply it to the students who get in trouble and say, you're not welcome to learn here in person. You do your learning online, off-site, from home. I think that's, that's intriguing. Genius. Very intriguing. Suzanne Daly says online learning was crap. Data has shown this, especially kids without home support and parents at home. Also, teachers cannot teach both um, online and in person simultaneously very well. That was one of the challenges that we found during COVID as well. Suzanne Daly, that is a fair point. Very novel ideas. Ah, Kelly Jackson agrees. Have the students causing the problem stay home and Zoom. Let the rule following kids go and learn in person. I love it. I mean, you're talking 13 or 1400 kids at Charlottesville High School and 30 to 50 of them are holding the school hostage. Yeah. Remove the 30 to 50 kids from the school and yeah. then allow the remaining 13 to 1400 to do what they want within the rules of the school. Right. All right, we got other ammunition we got to cover on the show here. Anything you want to add to this? I thought we've covered it very, very well today. I think there are some great ideas coming out of the, um, our viewers. And, For sure. Um, Hopefully, I like the crowdsourcing of ideas. Hopefully, some of those ideas are making it to the uh, making it to the school board and the administrators, and hopefully, they'll uh, listen and not say, "Oh, that's uh, too sensitive." Albert Graves. It used to be you get in a fight and you were suspended, but in today's defund the police society, it's not fair to suspend the kid. Right. It's a shame. It's a shame. Travesty. You're just teaching them that. Uh, there are no consequences to their actions. Yeah. And not only is that bad for everybody involved, but it's especially bad for the kids who are going to enter the real world and find out that 
I'm sorry, there are consequences for actions. Definitely. 100%. Um, they are not being well served by the school in this manner. They're being set up for failure. Yeah. They're being set the up. The exact opposite of what I think the, school, sc the school's intent is in being so lax. John Blair, thank you, um, thank you for the, the question, JB. We appreciate that. Interesting. Online learning, remote learning for the troublemakers. I don't know that it would last very long, but... Well, I think what would probably happen was they wouldn't do any of it because they're not doing it in person, but it does remove them from the environment. Yeah. Um, all right, this topic. This is an important one that I need to get to. This is a UVA topic. If you want to put the... the uh, then we'll go to a new restaurant in the downtown mall and venture capitalist Stefan Friedman uh, reshaping the F&B scene in, in the city. Um, UVA, how will UVA respond to, uh, first do the new student record for early UVA admissions, lower third. This number boggled my mind. For the class of 2028, according to the Cavalier Daily, the University of Virginia received 42,093 early action and early decision applications. You had the what is the population for Charlottesville City? Charlottesville City population. What do you think the population for Charlottesville City is, Juno? Oh. I'd say it's between, what do you think it is? I don't know, 35,000? I think it's between 45 and 46,000. Okay. Can you look that up for us? I'd say somewhere between 45 and 46,000. I'll give the stat again when Judah gives us the population for Charlottesville City. 45,6. Okay, so between, thank you, 45, between 45 and 46,000, 45,600? Yeah, 45,672. You basically had the population for Charlottesville City apply early for UVA early admissions for the mm. class of 2028. That puts it in perspective. The population of Charlottesville City applied early to get into the class of 2028. UVA is in the business of what? What is UVA in the business of? Making money. Making money. If you have more customers trying to give you money, <laughs> what will you do if you're in the business of making money? Uh, facilitate them. Take their money. Facilitate them. Figure out a way to accommodate the more customers trying to give you money. Mm -hmm. I've said on this talk show that the population for the UVA will uptick and uptick and uptick to the point, will it have, the point it will have an influence on the demographics in Charlottesville. And the influence it's going to have on the demographics in Charlottesville is mommy and daddy's credit cards, Range Rovers, Land Rovers, BMWs, and Mercedes-Benz. And if you think there's diversity at UVA from a student body standpoint, you are not reading the tea leaves correctly. It's a homogenous, wealthy population that is admitted into the University of Virginia. Why? Because it's expensive to go to college. And as the population upticks of students, the Land Rovers, the Range Rovers, the Mercedes-Benz, the Beamers will uptick. The credit cards will uptick. The housing will be cannibalized. The rents will escalate. And the socioeconomic demographics of the city will gentrify and change. 42,093 students with mommy and daddy's credit card, try to get into UVA for the class of 2028. The population for Charlottesville, Virginia is 45,672 people. The population of Charlottesville try to get into UVA for the class of 2028. That puts it in perspective. Next topic. New restaurant, Bonnie and Reed on the downtown mall. If you could put that lower third up, please, sir. Thank you kindly. This is in the old, I think it's a great location, do you? The Brasserie Cezanne location? Yeah, I mean, it's practically central. It's exactly. Across from the Jefferson. It's across from the Jefferson Theater. It's on the code building side of the downtown mall, which is the more popular side of the downtown mall. It's got a fantastic storefront. 
The, the storefront with that uh, deep green color stands out. Yeah. Stefan Friedman, the new owner of Bonnie and Reed, a seafood restaurant on the downtown mall. Chris Humphrey, the former owner of Fellini's, the former executive chef at Rapture. Chris Humphrey is a superstar chef. I hope they, I hope they, open, they stay open uh, Sunday <clears throat> early afternoon. We need a Thursday, good... Friday, Saturday, Sunday, dinner only. <sighs> Thursday, we Friday, need, Saturday. We need a, we need a good Sunday. seafood place. And it would be nice to have one where you could go, uh, go get some seafood for lunch after church. Hmm. You know why they're doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday dinner only? No. I would have bet that's, that's a, a labor. That's a labor call. Could be. That's a staffing labor call. Um... The owner of this business, Stefan Freeman, is the... Tom Stargell, we'll get to your comments in a matter of moments. Kelly Jackson, we'll get to your comments in a matter of moments. We've got every media outlet in town watching this show right now. Uh, the owner of this business, Stefan Freeman, owns the following businesses and brands. Draft Tap Room. You said that's your favorite on the downtown mall, favorite bar? I mean, it's just... I love having a, a great selection like that. He's promised it's going to open this spring. When I said this initially in the show, well, you just did it there again. You acted a bit, um, how would you hesitate? How would you characterize that facial expression? Uh, that's a tough question. I would say that... <coughs> to uh, your point, it's been closed for a while, <laughs> since the start of COVID. We're talking <clears throat> three years of closing here. I think it's at the same time... Uh, questioning or doubtful whether or not that's a, uh, a true timeline, as well as being a bit uh, nonchalant, considering the fact that they've had uh, somebody wrote in the window, we will open soon. It's been up for, what, months? Uh, yeah, no, months it's, that's been months. open for over a year. Yeah. Over a year. Opening so soon. at this point, it's like, oh, okay, well... When you decide to open it, some of us may actually come in and check it out again. But until then, well, whatever. So on the previous topic about offering remote learning for um, the troublemakers and mm -hmm. or offering remote learning, hybrid learning is an option for parents and students that are concerned of safety, Dylan's Rule sends us this message. Jerry and Judah how in the world can you and your viewers come up with these ideas about remote learning, at least it's something different, and last night's listening session did not come up with a single new insight or idea? He mm -hmm. highlights that in less than an hour, we have come up with ideas that the listening session could not birth, despite preparation and despite the, the, the immediacy of needing ideas. What baffles my mind is that they don't even have, they didn't even have any ideas going into the listening session. That's bingo. Really? Like Bingo. This is, you've had kids wandering your halls looking for fights and you have no idea what to do about it. What? And the only reason you're even talking about doing something about it is because teachers are strike. like... Did a strike. Yeah, are like, look... We're not gonna we're not gonna deal with these with these conditions, and the kids that that are trying to learn here definitely shouldn't have to de deal with these conditions. Well said. What also, to use your terminology, baffled my mind is starting the listening session by saying what we cannot talk about at the listening session. Yeah. Starting a listening session. The definition of the listening session is to listen to everything. Right. But starting the session saying you can't talk about this stuff, that is, I mean, out of touch. Yeah. That is brainwashing, communistic. Uh, it's definitely out of touch. <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> communistic? A stretch? I think that's stretching it a little bit. Authority telling its citizenship? what they can and cannot talk about under their control. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a bad look. Yeah, definitely. Terrible look. 
Suzanne Daly says this, so many like to admire the problem and not think creatively about solutions. Crowdsourcing ideas outside of the fishbowl often reveals new and fresh ideas. Bingo. Yeah. That's the whole concept of what Judah and I want to do with the I mm -hmm. Love Seville show, is we want to be the water cooler where ideas and, and topic matter are crowdsourced. That's mm -hmm. all we want to do with the show. We want to be the water cooler. Tom Stargell, a retired educator, a Golden Apple Award winner. There is not one veteran teacher who could not have told you exactly how the listening session was going to be carried forth by Charlottesville administration. Right. This tactic is how they always do it. Teachers have been shut down, so how will the union handle it? Will the next step by the union, the teachers' union, be a real next step? What is the real next step, Tom? And, and, and you're an experienced educator, an award-winning educator. Is the real next step a, a more definitive or lengthy sick out or strike or protest? What Probably. is the I, I, genuine question for Tom Stargell, who's decades of being a teacher? What is the real next step that the Charlottesville Union has to do? Mm -hmm. And if I mentioned this on Friday and I mentioned this on Monday, if you're the Albemarle teachers or the Albemarle soon-to-be union, you're getting the blueprint by your colleagues across the jurisdictional line of what to do. Tom Stargell says you need to extend the strike. Yeah. You need to extend the strike is what Stargell is saying. And he's a retired teacher. We're bouncing around here because we're bouncing around um, mm -hmm. as, as, the, as the crowdsourced commentary is coming in faster I, than we can keep up. I agree with him. You've got to extend the strike. Like I said, with just one day, it's easy for administration to dismiss as a one-off or, oh, we just had a bunch of teachers call out sick and... Calling a well, they did three days now. Uh, calling a meeting like they did for Monday and Tuesday. But that wasn't the teachers. I know that. But it, what I'm trying to say is that calling that meeting makes it look like they're listening. But the fact that they don't have any ideas yet and the fact that they're not w willing to listen to some of the ideas tells me that they're still not taking the teachers seriously. They, there it is. They knew they had to do something, and so they made it look like they're doing something, but they haven't actually come up with any ideas prior to this happening. And I think they need to understand that the teachers are serious, that this entire situation is serious, and not just some speed bump to be hand-waved behind them. To be brushed under the rug. And, uh, dude, well said. This was exactly the point that Shannon Gillikin, the president of the Charlottesville um, Education Association, the union she's the president of, she's a kindergarten teacher, she made this point in a statement. She said, this is not us who's calling the listening session, the union. Right. She also made the point of having the teachers on stage where they were getting addressed mm -hmm. by the audience almost gives the perception that the teachers are being interrogated yeah. or the teachers are under the, scru under the magnifying glass, the scrutiny, scrutinizing uh, spotlight. You see yeah. what I'm saying? I read, I read some of that too. And, and yeah, it make, like... It makes the teachers look like they're the ones that need to come up with a solution. Right. They're, they're the ones that are, that are the problem, or at least they're the ones that have been ignoring the problem, and that's clearly not the case. And, uh, yeah, the teachers have probably been begging administration to do something about this, and so to have them up there on stage painted as the... Uh, the criminals in, in this uh, situation. They were the ones that, the, having them on stage, exactly, was the proverbial lineup like at the, the police station. The teachers have absolutely no authority to change the way the school interacts with Well, now them. they do. No, they don't. Yes, they do. It's called a, a sick out. Now they do. Generally, but no, they, they, they have, they can... They can set the screws. They can... If you don't have teachers, they, you don't have a school. They can add pressure, but, that, but they still can't 
they still can't quantitatively change policy. This is what it should have been. What it should have been, instead of the teachers introducing themselves on the stage, it should have been Superintendent Gurley. It should have been two active school board members, because if you have three or more, then it's an actual school board meeting, and you can't do that because you have to call an act, actual meeting. It should have been yeah. Superintendent Gurley, two active school board members mm -hmm. on stage, and two, two of the four to be elected school board members on stage. It could have even been Superintendent Gurley's right hand lieutenant as well. So on the stage, it would have been, the, in, 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 a, in, a, in the right scenario, would have been Gurley, Gurley's right hand, two active school board members, and two uh, incoming. Uh, incoming school board members. Thank you. And it should have been those six people. It should not have been effing teachers on stage. And the first question should have been explain yourselves. The first, yeah, the first, yes. The first question had been like, what the heck is going on? And then the second question should have been like, what are your ideas to solve this, a tangible action plan? Yeah. And then the third question should have been, we're going to scrutinize your tangible action plan. Instead, yeah. we got a campfire with some guitars and some kumbaya and some marshmallows and some graham crackers and people doing some campfiring songing and singing. I don't know about that. Dude, it was BS. It was a BS, pomp and circumstance, dog and pony event. And yeah. all it did was blow smoke that pissed people off. Right, but I think that was fairly one-sided, right? I mean, the Judah is on fire today. I agree with you, Tom and Kelly. What, why, what do you think it's, why do you think it's one-sided? Well, I can see a group of administrators sniggering behind the, uh, behind the curtain. Uh, yeah, we took the spotlight off us and put it on them. one over. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've got teachers who are probably pissed off up on stage. You've got parents who are definitely pissed off out in the, in the uh, audience. audience. Or live streaming. That's why I, I don't see a whole lot of kumbaya campfire singing going on. What they wanted but. to do was the kumbaya. What they wanted to do was have a listening session to build community and campfire and marshmallowing and graham crackering and singing. Right. At my campfires, I got a flask and I'm sipping a little bourbon. Is that what you're doing at your campfire? <laughs> Probably. I'm pulling out the flask and sipping a little bourbon and I'm trying to pass it around to the other people around the campfire. Hopefully nobody is tossing something explosive. People are like, the, no, Jerry, campfire. stop it, damn it, no. The, it was a game that was played last night. It yeah. was a perception game to put the teachers in the spotlight and put Principal Gurley, Superintendent Gurley, and, the, uh, and, and, and school board members and soon-to-be school board members in the background. The host, the pant... Tell the us you have no clue what to do without telling us you have no clue yes. what to do. God, there it is. Tell us you have no clue what you're going to do without telling us that you have no clue they're what you're going to do. probably still thinking that their policies are going to work out in, in the end. Like somehow, some way, eventually, these kids who are causing all the problems... Are they're going to get better overnight. ...are going to realize that, uh, that the school administration is really rooting for them. And I, I don't know. It's, it's nuts. It's nuts. This is, this is crazy town. This is crazy town. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to lead to the gentrification of education. I'm telling you right now, those with means are dialing and emailing private schools left and right. I mean, we've already seen it. And it's, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, not going to get better. It's nuts. That's why Stargell saying extend the strike. Yeah. That's why Stargell is saying whatever happened last night was just a dog and pony show. I'm paraphrasing his comments. I want to finish the last topic before we get off air. Stefan Freeman, Stefan Freeman has draft tap room. He says it's going to open in the spring. He owns Vitae Spirits. He just purchased Vitae Spirits from Ian Glomsky. He purchased the draft tap room. Mm -hmm. He purchased he he purchased Ace Biscuit and Barbecue. He took over Brazier Saison and converted it to Bonnie and Reed. He's moving Vitae Spirits 
uh, from its Water Street tap room or tasting room to the downtown mall proper, completely right next to uh, Bonnie and Reed. And he's going to say, if you want to go to Bonnie and Reed and you're waiting for a table, go to this tap, go to this tasting room of Vitae Spirits and drink some booze, and then come over to Bonnie and Reed to eat some dinner. It's bro I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. Uh, Stefan Freeman's a venture capitalist, and he specializes in turning around businesses that are in shambles. He's going to try to do it with the ones he acquired. I heard some scuttlebutt licking, uh, linking him to uh, Licking Hole Creek, the brewery. Hmm. Let me confirm. Might just be scuttlebutt. And, and that he was going to purchase that brewery. But I haven't gotten any uh, clarification on Licking Hole Creek Craft Brewery and Mr. Freeman making that purchase. Uh, I see him from time to time at uh, Marigold. Fantastic uh, little watering hole and restaurant in Keswick. A hop, skip, and a jump uh, for me. Oh, Kevin Higgins said he bought Little John's too. Oh, Kevin Higgins said, is confirming, he bought Licking Hole Creek Brewery. Thank you, Kevin mm -hmm. Higgins. I'm getting messages, and, and maybe you're hearing this for the first time on the show. And I stand by when I reported about the Marie Bet team opening a version of their cafes in the old Anna's location. I stand by it. I stand by why I reported that they're opening a version of one of their cafes on Maury Avenue in a portion of the footprint at Ann's Pizza. I stand by what I said. We'll see. Time will tell. Kevin says he bought, Friedman bought Little John's in Licking Hole Creek. I'm getting messages from the Little John's Instagram account. And the Little John's Instagram account, newly launched Little, Grant, uh, Little John's Instagram account, has indicated that they are going to open, and I'm going to read verbatim what they DM'd me. Opening to be announced in 2024. We want to use this platform to generate a little buzz. They reached out to me. Little John's on the corner. Reopening in 2024. That's a great place, man. Spent many, and many a late night at Little John's. Remember Frank, the guy who worked the cash register at Little John's? He used to belly up to the uh, bar St. Martin's. He was a mug, a mug club. We used mm. to hang our mugs at St. Martin's. Do you ever go to St. Martin's? You know where St. Martin's is located? Yeah, it's back on, what? what is that, 14th? By the train tracks, yeah. yeah. By the corner. I used to go to St. Martin's all the time. Frank would love going to St. Martin's. Because a friend worked there, but I didn't, I've never really, I didn't really spend any time there. Can you name, Curtis Shaver's going to roll his eyes when I ask this question. What, uh, can you, how many bars in the city of Charlottesville can you name that do not have any windows? I don't think I know enough bars to... Uh... Bars in the city of... Sh I don't know too much about bar in law. <laughs> city of Charlottesville bars that don't have windows. St. Martin's was one. It's closed. There's one obvious one. Owned by Jordan Brunk. That's a hint. Uh, it doesn't help me, but I'm thinking uh, Livery Stable. That's actually got a teeny window. I thought it might. It's got a teeny window. Uh, what about uh, Alley Light? Do Johnny have, Ornalis, bingo. Do they have a window? Dirty Nellie's alley light. Viewers and listeners, does the alley light have a window? I think the alley light, does it have a window on the door? Jo Johnny, Johnny's mm. Ornalis, the owner of Guadalajara, Mexicale, El Mariachi. Judah, we're going to see him tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. here. We're looking forward to that meeting, Johnny. Um, yeah, I think alley light has windows on. Yeah, Ornalis says, yes, alley light has windows. Thank you, Johnny Ornalis. Dirty Nellies, no windows. Hmm. St. Martin's, previously no windows. But Frank, who worked the cash register at Little John's when I was in school, he would, he would take the change. This is when we were paying cash. Hmm. And he would take the change and throw it from one hand to another hand and hmm. catch it and then give it to you. It was like quite a show. I very much look forward to interacting with Frank at Little John's. Um, so Stefan Friedman... There's some, uh, Johnny Ornalis says a great old fashioned at the alley light. I'm a huge fan of old fashions. No doubt. Huge fan of old fashions. If you ha have you had the old fashioned at the mill room at the boar's head? One of the best old fashions in town. Doug, the bartender, I'm on a first name basis with him. He makes one of the best old fashions I've ever had at the mm. mill room at boar's head. 
Um, so Stefan Friedman now has Little John's, Licking Hole Creek, Draft Tap Room, Ace Biscuit and Barbecue, Vitae Spirits, and Bonnie and Reed. That's seven restaurants. He very DL and quietly and under the radar has become one of the most prolific restaurant owners and food and beverage owners in Charlottesville and Almaro County. Hmm. In fact, all those but Licking Hole Creek are in city of Charlottesville. Um, all right, that's the talk show for today. Suzanne Daly, I appreciate your comments. Vanessa Parkhill, I appreciate your comments. Viewers and listeners, I appreciate your comments. Yeah, he used to flip quarters, Albert Graves. He says, please open Little John's. Sounds like Little John's is reopening. Oh, SHB, hello. Sarah Hill Buchensky. Once again, the people that the policies are supposed to help are actually getting hurt, which further, further is the gentrification of education. Maybe the administration isn't really trying to help. Um, Randy O'Neill, public schools are criminal enterprise, laundering money on everything. I'm not going to go that far. I'm not going to go that far. I'm not going to go. I, I, I got so many comments coming in. The SHB comment got pushed down, and I like SHB's comments. Uh, all right, SHB's comment. Once again, the people that the policies are supposed to help are actually getting hurt. Further gentrification of education. Maybe the administration isn't really trying to help minority students. Hmm. I think the administration can't see the forest through the trees. And they're more concerned with juking the stats than actually uh, serving the students that are trying to learn the right way. They're more concerned with graduation rates and manipulating graduation rates than serving students that are trying to learn the right way. Yeah. Judah Wickauer, Jerry Miller. It's the I Love Seville show on a rainy Tuesday afternoon. Tomorrow is Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, and the word on the street is Keith Smith and I will be wearing some kind of headdress, Keith said. Ooh. Time will tell. Thank you for joining us, guys, on a Tuesday. So long, everybody.